Okay, I'm ready. So we start now. Point. Good morning, everybody. Nice to have you all on board. So we have members from all parts of the world, I think. So some have night time, some have daytime. Uh, <laughs> let's hope we can stay awake. We have an interesting program in the soil sections, uh, uh, poster section of uh, the Tropentag. So we'll stay ab about uh, one hour uh, together. Point. Good morning, for everybody. Nice so to have you all on board. So have. we have members from all parts of the world, I think. So some have night time, some have daytime. Uh, <laughs> let's hope we can stay awake. We have an interesting program in the soil sections, uh, a poster section of uh, the Tropentag. So we'll stay ab about uh, one hour uh, together. Uh, good morning, every everybody. Presenter. Everybody nice has a nice presentation. I don't know what's going on here. Parts of the world, I think. So some have night time, some have daytime. Uh, uh, yeah. So I switch. I switch actually off now my micro function because there seems to be a technical problem, and I would like ask Luyen to present her poster. I'm not going to introduce everybody with the title of the poster because I expect. That is within your presentation. So we start with Vien, please. I'm Van Nguyen from University of Pohnhan. I'm going to talk about my research is applying geoelectric methods to investigate soil salinity in rice production system in the Vietnam Mekong Delta. The Mekong Delta. And the Mekong Delta is also contribute for 90% of national exported rice. Just a note to the technique se session uh, section, I do not have any tone here. I also didn't hear any main voices from the recording. My capillary rise of salinity into the topsoil, geoelectric matters were considered. Advantages of these matters are rapid, cost effective, and non destructive without drilling and spending time for analysis in the laboratory. It has been applied in many fields, but there are limited applications in agriculture. Therefore, this study was conducted to investigate the suitability of two geoelectric methods to access the soil salinity in rice production system in the Mekong Delta. Seems there's always a problem when a new slide is starting, so we have to switch on the tone again. Guyen, if the tone is not coming, then perhaps uh, you can comment directly. Arrest to measure resistivity of... Um, 
we are applying two geoelectric methods that are RS2 and EM38. The RS2 will be measure the electrical con re resistivity and uh, it is can detect the resistivity of the subsoil layer until uh, 50 meter depth. Um, and EM38, we are using to measure the uh, conductivity and uh, for the topsoil layer uh, up to one meter depth. Can you change to another slide? And this is the case study in our research. That is um, one of the province in the Mekong Delta. And this is, um, we have a both side of the province, there's a river and the sea in the, um, the southeast of the province. So it is strongly affected by the salinity gradient uh, in this area. And we measured um, the, the different um, growth system uh, in the Mekong Delta. The, the, the green, the greens, the greens, green is blue. This is um, a triple rise growth uh, per year uh, because it's, it is uh, close to the uh, what fresh water resources. So they can plant the rice for the three times per year. And the, in the south of the province, they uh, have a double rice crop because it's strongly affected by salinity. So they have lack of uh, fresh water. So just only two crops uh, per year. And could you please move to the next? And this is uh, the results of the RS2. That is the resistivity at the, the site uh, number one that I marked. And this is a show that uh, the, we measure the resistivity with RS2 for different uh, electro spacings from two meters to five meters to detect the uh, the different, uh, the widest spacing of electro will give the, the deeper um, measurement. Well, with, uh, for uh, all of the electro spacing, we can detect it, the water table started from eight meter depth uh, for the uh, triple rise um, field in the Mekong Delta. Uh, however, the uh, one, two meter and three meter electro spacings can detect the water table until 20 meters and 30 meters depth. However, the four meters and five meters can still can see the water table until 40 and 50 meters. Among the uh, um, four electro spacings, uh, we uh, see that the four and five meters uh, spacing is get a better uh, of the water detected. So um, this is uh, show the consistent of the uh, water table uh, at a deep layer, but in at the, the surface of the uh, the field is show a different inconsistent of the resistivity at the surface layer and because because uh, the four and five meters of spacings is uh, can see the not so much difference at the lower layers. So we we choose the four meters spacings because it give the useful information for the deeper soil and salinity uh, explanation. Uh, this that is our um, purpose. And uh, regarding to the uh, EM38 measurement, it is uh, show that the uh, EM38 can uh, re reflect the surface water fluxes and is also indicate uh, depressions uh, at some uh, point that happen high values of the conductivity. So could you please move?
And to compare the two um, equipment, we uh, make the regression between the topsoil resistivity by using RS2 and uh, with the different uh, electro spacings and the uh, topsoil uh, conductivity by using EM38. And the correlation between uh, these two is um, not st strong uh, correlation and the RS2 tend to um, underestimate the soil conductivity by using the EM38. Please come to the conclusion. You are just over Yeah, that, could you please move to the conclusion? And uh, to sum up with uh, our research at um, this stage, it is um, we conclude that the RS2 with four electro uh, spacing reliable for detecting the water table below the, the rice field in the Mekong Delta. And the EM38 for the topsoil conductivity measurements uh, do not correlate with the EM uh, with the RS2 topsoil values. So uh, we uh, conclude that it, it should be have a combination of EM38 and RS2 for uh, evaluate the salinity problems in the rice field in the Mekong Delta. Okay, thank you very much, Nguyen, for this live commentation. I'm sorry for the technical problems, but that happens in online conferences. Uh, thank you. I don't, see, I don't see any question, and I'm not going to allow for any questions since we are already uh, far uh, beyond uh, our time schedule. If we have time at the end, probably there will be uh, other questions coming in. So now I would call for the presentation of uh, Mr. Abdallah El Sheikh, please. Sorry, I, I kind of designed it on a Boston session, so Hello, this is a bit... Oh. Um, but then you can comment on online, online, probably. I'm honored to present on behalf of my co-author, our poster titled Soil Phosphorus Availability in Beach West Amended Soil. The topic can you raise your voice, please? We can't hear you. Please raise your voice. Terminated. This is the record already. I recorded it last time. Ah, okay. Yeah. The high maintenance. Um, understanding this behavior um, is a key for sustainable phosphorus management in the soil for high crop productivity. The west used in this study was obtained from a manganese mining company near Umhalanga, Blanga, South Africa. Um, uh, we used uh, phosphate rocks and potassium dihydrogen phosphate as a source of phosphorus in this soil. And um, we used three dose, like uh, no phosphorus addition, or recommended dose, double the recommended dose, and three times of the recommended dose. And uh, just the mixture, the soil and the manganese waste were incubated for, were incubated for, um, 60 days, we took soil sample at zero days, 30 and 60, and in general available phosphorus concentration decreased after the, the application of manganese waste. And phosphorus concentration in the sandy soil were usually higher than the clay soil, and this could be explained by the higher um, service. Uh, area in the clay soil which absorb more phosphorus compared to the sandy soil and the rock phosphate um, um, or phosphate rocks has a lower um, performance than the potassium dihydrogen phosphate. And in conclusion, um, manganese rich um, manganese rich waste caused a reduction in the amount of phosphorus concentration and this could be taking in consideration when we are growing plant in the man, in manganese rich soil by um, add more phosphorus more than the uh, ordinary dose and also further research is required to mitigate manganese rich waste um, such as phytoremediation techniques.
So I guess that was a presentation. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, quite short. You are saving time for us. That's very kind I of think, you. I think as I understand it on the guideline that I have to speak for three minutes. So yeah, that, I did. That's, that's true. So every, everything is fine. <laughs> okay. I don't know whether you have an additional comment. Otherwise, I would, I would ask, uh, since I don't see any question here in the section, mm. I would ask, um, as I have seen, actually, uh, the original phosphorus uh, content of the soils that you use are already relatively high. Mm. So uh, why do you think that here now uh, you should additionally add uh, phosphorus? I didn't really get the scope of your study. So oh. you, want, you want to use waste and give this waste to agricultural surfaces? Is that your intention? Yeah, it's, I think the main thing is the, to study the relation between the manganese availability or, and phosphorus availability. How the manganese concentration can affect the phosphorus and which type of phosphorus fertilizer. Is it the same if you use like rock phosphate or potassium dihydrogen phosphate? And but the soil type. Mm. But before you come to the phosphate question, the question would be whether uh, you have manganese toxicity that mm. becomes a problem. So I think the first thing to analyze would be actually the manganese availability, isn't it? In the soil. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. The first problem, if you, if you get mangan man manganese toxicity, then you do, do not need to care for the phosphate. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah. So then we are already progressed in time. So I would like to ask Mr. Ruiz Hutan to present his poster, please. Uh, okay, I think that uh, the video is so broad. Dear auditors, my name is Jose Alejandro Ruiz. And together with my co-authors, I welcome you to our research title, Phosphate Solubilizing Activity of Native Watermelon Isolates of Pseudomonas Fluorescence. Our research was carried out in the region of Guatemala where the Andesol soils are present. That means in the southern, central, and western regions of the country. These kind of soils have a volcanic origin and present the fixation phosphorus phenomena in which the soil retains the phosphorus. It avoids the uptake by the plant, increasing the application of the chemicals fertilizers to fulfill the plant's requirements. For that, our goal is reducing dependence on phosphorus fertilizers through the use of phosphate solubilizing microbes. In this case, we evaluated pseudomonas fluorescence bacteria. About the methods we obtained, Pseudomonas fluorescent isolates from adisol soil samples. Then we made an identification by PCR with a specific primers. After that, the AFLP fingerprinting was made, and finally we cultivated the isolates on NBRIP medium with tricalcium phosphate as an insoluble source of phosphorus. With diameters of colony and solubilization halo, we calculated the phosphate solubilization index. As results, we obtained a total of 35 isolates, and after the evaluation, all of them revealed phosphate solubilization capacity in a wide range of phosphate solubilization index from one up to four. Also, we found a high genetic diversity within the analyzed isolates, forming a first group with the highest and a second group with lowest phosphate solubilization index. Isolates from the central region exhibited higher values of phosphate solubilization index while isolates from the western region showed lower values of phosphate solubilization index. Because the relation between the isolates and its origin, we assume that as higher the fixation of phosphorus in the soil, higher the activity of the microbes. About solubilization stability, we did not observe a defined pattern 
after the receding of the isolates. As conclusions, we revealed the potential of native pseudomonas fluorescent isolates to be a sustainable alternative to the problem of phosphorus fixation, from which the current dependence on chemical fertilization results. With this, we hope to bring a friendly environmental option to the farmers and reduce the risk of the environmental pollution. It is also important to mention the advantage of local adaptation of adaptive isolate to biotic and abiotic factors like the relation with other soil microorganisms, soil humidity, temperature, and others. We recommend further studies to evaluate the efficiency of the native isolates under field conditions. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward for your questions. Okay, thank you very much for uh, keeping the time. Again, I do not see any kind of questions, the question and answer section of the WOBA app. So I would ask the presenters, do you have any questions to Mr. Ruiz? Yes, I have a question, please. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, may I ask how you are going to bring this uh, study into practice? Uh, as might know, Sodomonas uh, could be uh, pathogenic to plants. And uh, if you want to apply Sodomonas uh, practically in the field to be able to solubilize phosphate, how would you control uh, the, this aspect, for example? Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. And there are previous studies when um, other authors uh, have applied pseudomonas fluorescence to the, to the soil, that means in uh, field conditions, and it results in very good uh, results about uh, availability of phosphorus. And it not represent any risk for uh, like a pathogen for the, for the plant. So the next step for us, because this uh, research was carried out in vitro, the next step is uh, going to the field. But um, we have previous experience also uh, not documented yet because we are uh, writing the, the article, but uh, we have experienced that there is not any risk uh, for, uh, for the plants that like, for example, if uh, these isolates is becoming in pathogen for the plants. But yeah, it, it is uh, quite a good question because yeah. also uh, we try to, to make another evaluations with some kind of species from the genus uh, Bacillus and yeah. it's a very, very risky um, methodology. So there is a, no risk for mutation, for possible mutation in future? Mm, I think that uh, that's the reason why we need to make some evaluations on field. And um, okay. our proposal maybe is to make this uh, evaluation in pots, for example, mm. and then we can uh, uh, do it in greenhouses before to do it, the, the, the field work completely. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. We have to continue. Uh, so I would like to call the presentation of Mr. Iqbal, who is present, I see. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zafar Iqbal and I am doing my PhD in soil science from Islamia University of Bahawalpur in Pakistan. In Hohenheim, I am working as a guest research scholar under the supervision of Dr. Rashi. Today I will be presenting about possible phosphate solubilization mechanism and growth promotion of wheat through bacillus species. First of all, I will briefly describe the importance of phosphorus. A high amount of phosphorus is present in soil, but it is not available for plant uptake. Secondly, about 80% of applied phosphatic fertilizers becomes unavailable as they bind with calcium and magnesium. Therefore, the availability of phosphorus has been a major challenge for scientists working in sustainable agriculture. We can increase the availability of phosphorus with the help of bacteria, but the question is how bacteria solubilize phosphorus that is what I will be talking about today. Moving on toward hypothesis, 
we assume that excretion of organic acid and enzyme activities of bacteria helps in phosphorus solubilization moving on toward objectives which is identification of enzymes and organic acid in the presence and absence of tricalcium phosphate for this purpose bacterial strains were isolated and characterized for phosphorus solubilization in pakistan during eight months in germany i am working on the mechanism of phosphorus solubilization bacterial strains were grown in presence and absence of tricalcium phosphate and following parameters were measured which majorly include alp gene expression secretion of organic acids and solubilized phosphorus contents all of this brought us toward the following results all these strains showed different growth behavior in the presence and absence of tricalcium phosphate which you can see in the figure on the left side all these strains reached the stationary phase at fifth day of incubation in the absence of tcp while they grew up to the seven day in the presence of tcp secondly all these strains showed amplicon for alp gene this means they have the ability to control alkaline phosphatase activity in rhizosphere which stimulate root growth and excretion of organic acids moving on toward the next results you can see in the top left figure strain zd15 solubilized maximum phosphorus followed by zd32 these both strains have maximum enzyme activities which you can see in the bottom two figures moving on toward gcms analysis of bacterial metabolome multi dimensional scaling showed that strains zd15 produce maximum organic acids in the presence of tricalcium phosphate Finally these strains were inoculated on wheat seed and root development was measured maximum root growth was observed with strains at R3 while the maximum seedling driver mass was measured with strains at D15 To conclude my presentation we found out that strains at D15 produce maximum organic acids having highest enzyme activities and maximum solubilized phosphorus contents Therefore we can say that the excretion of organic acid helps in phosphorus solubilization and these strains have potential to be used as phosphorus solubilizing multi strain biofertilizer in alkaline soil which is affordable and eco friendly option for sustainable agriculture thank you for your attention Again, thank you very much for keeping the time. That was perfect. A little bit fast for me, but probably the others are younger and can receive <laughs> this information better than me. So again, I don't see any questions from the crowd. So then I ask the presenters, do you have any questions to Mr. Iqbal? I don't hear anything and I would pose a question. Uh, if we believe in chemistry, then actually the pKs value of organic acids is too high in order to solubilize calcium phosphate. So the organic acids alone cannot be the reason that we get solubility of the uh, phosphate. So what is the reason then? Actually, uh, I can't clearly understand uh, your question, but uh, uh, there is not in, organic in, acid. In easy uh, words, in easy words, if you apply pure I, organic acids to rock phosphates, for example, to calcium phosphates, you are not going to solubilize it. You can test that that has been done several times. So the organic acids alone are not able to solubilize. So, yes, uh, and uh, I also uh, discussed in presentation there is some enzyme activities that is alkaline phosphatases activities that helps in uh, solubilization. And... So that is actually that is actually the point. Yeah. So, but you stressed in your conclusion that it's it's the organic acids, and that's not true. Yeah, uh, I already dis uh, I think I discussed, but I will uh, correct it myself again okay. later on. So, and that was uh, I think enzyme activities that helps. Uh, and that promote production of organic acid as well. Okay, thank you very much. So we are going to continue. Uh, the next person to present would be Esan Kane. I didn't see in, in in the presenters board, so I don't know whether I would like to ask the technic section whether we have a presentation from him available.
there is no presentation. There is no presentation, it seems. So then we we skip him from the presenter's list. Then the next one would be SIA Padonu. Sorry if I don't pronounce it right. There are so many different people from different countries and I'm not perfect in all their languages. There should be prediction of soil erosion under three tillage systems. So everyone, we have my name presentation, so please go ahead. Is Ezai, and together with the co authors, I welcome you into this poster presentation titled Prediction of Soil Erosion under Three Chile Systems using ROS and GAS model. Here is the overview of the poster I'm presenting. Soil erosion is a big threat to the environment and agricultural production system. For example, 30 tons per hectare of soil is lost every year in the world, from which 60% is induced by human activities. And this trend is expected to be increased by 17% in the next coming year. So, it is very important to find sustainable practices that can be used to reduce soil erosion. In this study, we quantified soil erosion from three tillage systems. These are flat tillage, rich and furrow, and tight ridge tillage. And we predicted soil erosion using ROS and GAS model. To do that, we set up experiments using lysimeters, and we use maize as test crop. We try to mimic the three different tillage into the lysimeters. Here is the flat tillage, followed by the ridge and furrow, and the third one is the tide ridge, where we can see the tides that conserve rainfall water within the soil. From this setup, we collected runoff water in this gallon, and we collected the direct soil loss using this collector system. For the prediction, these two equations show the basic principles behind the two models we use. The most important thing we did here is to link the runoff water we collected into the two models. We use the mean absolute error to evaluate the two models. When this index equal to zero, it means the model is perfect. The results show that rainfall during major season was double what of minor season, and the runoff was higher under rich and furrow, followed by flat tillage and tight ridge tillage. Subsequently, soil erosion follow the same order, and tight ridge reduced soil erosion up to 43 to 100%. And this trend can be seen in these two graphs where ridge and furrow is very high and tight ridge very low. Ross and gas models adequately captured the effect of the tillage on soil erosion. The predictions were much better for minor season, tight ridge, and flat tillage with mean absolute error equal to 0 and 0 0.3 respectively. In conclusion, soil erosion varied with rainfall pattern, and it is greatly affected by tillage practices. That is why tight ridge tillage significantly reduces soil erosion and can be used as practice in the field to reduce land degradation. ROS and GAS models can be applied for soil erosion simulations from the three tillage system for future studies. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, I still have him. Uh, I still don't see him in the presenters' board, so probably we are not able to uh, ask question. Just a remark from my side: if you don't present uh, the results of your simulation, you shouldn't put it into your conclusions. Yeah, so here we have seen conclusions that are not justified, at least not from the content of the poster itself. Okay, otherwise tide ridging is known to reduce uh, erosion efficiently, so that is actually 
uh, something that is documented by other research results. Any comments from the other presenters with respect to this uh, erosion study? I was just wondering about the flat tillage. Does it mean the zero tillage or is it something else like the, what is the flat tillage? So I actually I would I would have had the same question as you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I was not really sure what, what that actually meant. What is the flat tillage? Yeah, it's, it's okay. a very new term for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then we are going to continue to the next uh, presentation. I, I'm happy that Mr. Diogo is present. I ask you for your presentation, please. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, present uh, the results of uh, this study. Uh, together with my co-authors, I would like to welcome you to uh, this study that we conducted in, uh, in the northern part of Benin. My name is Diogo Rodrigue. I'm from the University of Paracu in northern Benin. So uh, as you might uh, already know, cross-border uh, transhumans is a, a, widespread, a widespread phenomenon in West Africa, whereby animals uh, move uh, usually from the drier areas to the uh, wetter areas to, uh, to, to search for uh, better resources to be able to uh, improve the animal productivity. However, um, Benin is uh, uh, every year receiving a high uh, uh, number of animals uh, which is estimated to be more than 2 million of cattle herd that uh, uh, are usually trucked from the Sahelian region to, towards the West African coast. And uh, uh, this uh, is a matter of debate whereby uh, people are wondering if we, uh, most of the time or every year, we, uh, we're going to receive this uh, uh, high number of animals, what is going to happen? And even recently, last year, our government uh, uh, set in regulation to uh, to 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 to, uh, to regulate, I would say, these activities. And uh, this study was conducted uh, in the framework of uh, this uh, political uh, uh, regulation to be able to find some uh, solution uh, to this. Uh, activities that uh, is highly uh, 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 um, bringing uh, economic return to uh, the headers and also to, 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 to the nations. So what we did is that we, we, we chose two different uh, site where we, we wanted to, to evaluate the effect of uh, transhumans and of vegetation type, as we assume that uh, this activity may, may disturb the, uh, the soil. And also uh, many people think that transhuman uh, cattle are degrading the environment. Therefore, we chose two municipalities in the northern part of Benin, whereby we, uh, we uh, try to uh, evaluate the vegetation types that are prevailing we have uh, three types of vegetation type in the, these two municipalities that were chosen in the northern part of Benin. And uh, we have, for example, open forest, uh, uh, woodland savanna, uh, wooded savanna, shrubland savanna, and crop feed mosaic. So we chose two, uh, within those uh, two municipalities, we also chose uh, uh, two areas. One is known to be uh, highly frequented by uh, cattle herd, which we call a uh, strong uh, transhuman zone, and the the second area was known to be uh, a, a weak transhuman zone. Uh, normally, it's an area where animals are not uh, allowed to graze. So we've collected soil samples, which we analyzed for organic matter uh, and pH. 
and uh, we also um, try to uh, evaluate the the the, the soil uh, the pressure uh, to mimic using the penetrometer. We 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 determine the pressure that the animal would have accepted on the soil while uh, pasturing. Therefore, soil compaction was calculated on the top soil, uh, from the top soil layer, and then we compare uh, this data in the two zones and also to see whether vegetation types could have significant effect on these variables that we've measured. As you can see from the result, uh, the vegetation type and also uh, transhuman zone ha have a strong influence on the soil compaction. Moreover, we found that uh, the vegetation zone significantly influences the uh, organic matter content of the soil. But most interestingly, we did not find any effect of, transhuman, uh, of transhumans now from vegetation type on uh, uh, influencing the soil pH. So uh, what we uh, conclude is that in Northern Benin, transhumans affect soil compassion but do not affect its fertility. It is true that we did not determine all uh, soil fertility parameters, but we use the key, uh, some key indicators that are very relevant that could uh, indicate the soil health. Animals, uh, therefore, we recommend that animals should be strategically managed on rangeland to avoid soil compaction. Vegetation type affect soil compaction as uh, uh, we've seen from the result that the organic matter content strong, uh, uh, varies strongly according to vegetation type. So we recommend that further studies are needed to evaluate appropriate carrying capacity on rangeland and the, to also evaluate the role of manure deposited in, in soil health improvement. Because we think that if manure that is deposited by the animal during the, uh, the, the grazing could substantially help contribute to improving the organic matter content of the soil. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. You have been uh, in time. We have time for one question. I don't see any questions from the crowd. So again, I ask the other presenters, do you have any question to Mr. Diogo? Is this I do have, I guess. Yeah, it, is, it is just a very short one. I'm just wondering what is your reference? Like, what is the control? What are you comparing to? OK, thank you. In fact, the, uh, the, the reference site is the, the site that is uh, 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 that is being known to be uh, uh, transhumans prohibited. I mean, there are areas that animals are not supposed to graze, and these areas are well known. And the oh. other areas is uh, because usually in the, transhuman, in the transhuman areas, they use corridors where animals can use those corridors to, to, uh, to graze on pasture. But in the other areas, they are not certainly fenced areas, but then they are open areas where animals uh, are not normally supposed to graze. And how is the stocking rate? Is it known the stocking rate for the livestock? Yeah, the stocking rate is uh, usually high. Uh, it, depend, it depends on the head that are uh, 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 grazing on the area. In the head, you may, you may have sometimes up to Hundred or even more than hundred uh, uh, head of cattle in one herd, so uh, this is not really uh, strongly regulated because uh, it depends on uh, the uh, the purchasing power of the owner of the head and also of the herder that is conducting the head. So uh, so far there is no strict regulation that uh, 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 enforce the law to say that uh, herders shouldn't have a, a low or medium on ha or high uh, amount of cattle in the herd uh, while uh, uh, mm. pasturing. Yeah, okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, okay, thank you yeah. very much. We have to You're welcome. Continue. Yeah. And I'm happy that Mariko Ingold is with us and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Diogo, you should actually leave the screen.
please close yeah. on your presentation. Yeah. And I would like that's what I'm trying oh, okay. to do. Mrs. Ingold, did you upload the presentation? Yeah. Okay, here we are. Okay. Welcome to this short introduction of our poster with the title Dietary Tenants Reduce Soil Respiration After Goat Manure Application on an Irrigated Sandy Soil in Oman. Irrigated agriculture in the subtropics is characterized by high gases, carbon and nitrogen losses due to favorable conditions for soil microorganisms. Therefore, the application of organic matter, like animal manure, is crucial for sustainable agricultural practices. Tenants present in many browse species can stabilize organic matter in manure of animals feeding on them. Therefore, we investigated if dietary tenants affect soil respiration after fertilization of radish with goat manure. To this end, we conducted a two-year field experiment in Soha in Oman to measure carbon dioxide emissions from soils fertilized with manure. The manure was collected from male goats of a local breed, fed a basal diet without feed additives or with 3.4% cabracho tannin extract. Urea served as a mineral fertilizer control. Here in this table you can see the carbon and nitrogen application rates in kilograms per hectare. Gas emissions were measured using a photoacoustic multi-gas analyzer connected to a closed chamber, which you can see on the picture here. In this slide you can see the average daily emission rates of CO2 during the two radish cultivation periods. The mixed model ANOVA across both seasons revealed significant differences between all fertilizer treatments, with lowest soil respiration from mineral plots, indicated by the black symbols, and then slightly lower soil respiration from the Kipracho tannin plots, indicated with the red line, compared with the control. The cumulative carbon losses during radish cultivation showed that gold manure applications resulted in more than twice as much carbon dioxide losses compared with mineral fertilizer. However, related to the carbon input, mineral plots lost 10 to 15 times more carbon than was applied. In the gold manure plots, losses reached 50 to 74% of applied carbon. Despite a clear tendency of reduced CO2 emissions in Capraccio tannin uh, treatments by 5 to 10 percent, this difference was not significant. From our results, we conclude that gases carbon losses were high in all treatments and highlights the importance of organic matter input to irrigated sandy soils in the subtropics. Feeding of Kebracho tenants reduced carbon losses, thus stabilizing organic matter in manure, although the overall effect was relatively small. Results on gases nitrogen losses, which might be more affected by the protein binding tenants, are underway. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice presentation and uh, we you can answer live. I don't see questions from the crowd coming in. So I ask the other presenters, do you have any questions? If this is not the case, I have a question <laughs> and actually the application of tenants cannot be your primary can, cannot have been your primary motivation simply to reduce the CO2 emission, is it? You are measuring a side effect. So what was the primary motivation to apply tenants to the goats? Yes, thank you for this very good uh, question. Um, so of course this um, the effect on uh, on the manure um, is is as you said, a, a side effect. But um, there are many um, studies on the effect of tannins on the animals. 
And um, it was um, reported um, that tannins have um, a beneficial effect on health, like um, tannins in feed can uh, reduce the um, parasite infections of animals. It can also reduce um, methane emissions from animals on bloat. And um, it's, it was also found that it has an effect on the nitrogen or the protein utilization in animals. And um, so this project was actually a combination. So we were feeding it to the animals and uh, one part was looking at the animal feed digestibility and so on. And then we were using this manure to see, okay, and what is the effect on the soil, which is usually not investigated. So we have a lot of um, yeah, knowledge on tannin effect in, in, on the animal side, but not what happens then with the manure and nutrient cycling effects. And of course, usually you would not feed a tannin extract. This was for um, yeah, scientific um, purposes because we needed a, um, a, a homogeneous product, but usually the animals would browse on tannin containing um, species like acacia or so, and so on. Yeah. Okay, then, then I would ask an additional question that is, what was the effect on the methane emission? Because uh, methane is a much more influencing uh, a greenhouse gas. So could you reduce the methane emission? Uh, actually, this was not measured because... Um, hey. ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, would have been very interesting. Um, but the um, project side on the animal side, we're really focusing on the, the digestibility and um, the device which we use to measure in the field, it's very practical because you can have directly effect uh, results in the field, but it is um, unfortunately not useful for measuring methane. Yeah, it's only for carbon dioxide emission, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. So thank you very much for these answers. So we come just in time to the last presentation, and I'm glad that we have Mr. Yunanto with us. So we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Teddy Yunanto from Bandung Polytechnic of Energy and Mining, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, Indonesia. Today, I would like to present my paper entitled The Potential of Cultivating Fruit on x men Soil in Indonesia. My team consists of Ms. Parisatul Amana, Mr. Dodi Harika, and me. As we know that forests have been food resources, particularly for local people. However, mining operation in forest area result in substantial reduction and even the loss of flora and fauna, such as fruit plants. To restore the forest function, main reclamation is conducted and fruit plant can be cultivated although the soil is in a poor condition. The study therefore aims to review the potential of cultivating rambutan or Nepalium lapacem on x main soil in comparison with the guideline online suitability assessment provided by the Ministry of Agriculture. The study was conducted in Binungan site, PT Braukal is Kalimantan Province, Indonesia. PT Braukal has cultivated rambutan since 2005 in more than uh, 1,000 hectares with three cultivars. The study started by soil analysis in Binungan site to test the suitability for rambutan cultivation on X mining land. The soil sample were taken in six locations with different edge of mine reclamation. The sample were taken from 0 0.30 and 30 to 60 cm depth. Some parameters then test such as pH, organic carbon, and potassium, etc. Afterward, the soil quality was classified based on the guideline on land evaluation for agricultural commodities, particularly rambutan, by the Indonesian Ministry of Agriculture. From the figure 2, we can see that the pH in seek location had very low value below 4.5. And overall, the result of this analysis showed that the soil had low fertility rate. Based on the guideline, this X-Men soil is classified as S2, 
It means that the soil has limiting factor and that affect productivity and require additional input by farmers. From this study, we can also understand that although X Mine Reclamation Site has lower soil quality, but is improving due to proper reclamation maintenance to be productive land. The intensification process, such as fertilization, proper cultivar selection, etc., has to be conducted in order to improve the soil quality and fruit production. And from this study, I want to highlight that there is an improvement on soil quality in Mine Reclamation through years so that it's become better. After what we want to endorse that X mine reclamation also can be productive land again. It is possible to restore the X mine reclamation to be a forest and poor resource for both local community and animal. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Again, I don't see any questions from the crowd. So again, I'm going to ask the other presenters whether they have a direct question to Mr. Yunanto and his results. This does not seem to be the case. So again, I'm going to ask what kind of mining actually had been done on these uh, places. So what has been mined? Mr. Yunan. Uh, this is the coal, coal mine company. Coal mining company. So yeah. they conduct it with the open pit mining method, let's call it. So yeah. they, they took the coal community, so they removed the soil. So remove the soil, but unfortunately the topsoil and subsoil already mixed. Mm -hmm. Already mixed. And after that, so if they want to do the post mining, or we call it reclamation, they only put 50 centimeters for the soil. And then they plant the, this, uh, this uh, fruit plant, we call it uh, rambutan, something like that. Uh -huh. Actually, you could have shared some rambutan with us, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I saw you in a little bit uh, small picture in the poster, but that's small picture. <laughs> what, I, what I wanted to ask is actually, uh, have these soils been actually mixed with mining residues or not? No, no, no. The only mix between the topsoil and subsoil. Ah, there is okay. no residual from mining to uh, mix with the soil. So we, we can assume more or less that it is a kind of natural parent material for soil formation. It was, was, was mixed by replacing it and putting it into another place. That's the case? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's the case. Okay. Thank you very much. So we have 9.59. So uh, actually, we are at the end of our session. I would like to thank you all presenters for keeping the time. I'm apologizing for any kind of technical problems that uh, we had. And I wish you a nice continu continuation uh, uh, within the Tropentag. Uh, actually, I'm on vacation now, so I'm the best off. So have a nice time and hope to see you somewhere again. Goodbye. Okay. Hello, hello to my presentation entitled Using the Best Land Preparation Leads to an Increase the Crop Productivity in Sudan, prepared by Majdaddin Rahmatullah Abul Ghasim from National Center for Research, Environment, Environment Natural Resources and Certification Institute, Sudan. Introduction. Here I will give you some definitions for the land preparation. Land preparation is the one of the most important operation for agricultural mechanization and the most expensive operation uh, consuming high cost of tractor power. 
Tillage practice is modifying the state of the soil in, in order to provide suitable condition for the plant growth. Conventional tillage or over tillage may increase the risk of water loss and soil erosion by wind and water. Objectives the, object, the objectives of this study are determining the most suitable tillage practice under the arid and semi arid land, studying the effect of some tillage methods on soil physical properties and crop yields. Study area The field experiment was or were carried out for two successive seasons in the study area of Omdurman west of. Khartoum state, which is located in this longitude and latitudes, which shown in the figure. Methods to achieve the objectives of this study, we used two types of tractors with different draft force uh, used in this study. The first one is the tester, and the second one is the auxiliary. Also, we used two types of primary plows, disc plow and chisel plow. We use in this study also two secondary plows, disc harrow and ridger plow in addition to an animal crown plow. These some discs or some plows which you use in this study. The parameters parameters which has been investigated in this study such as the first one the land has been prepared using the chisel plow in depths of 30 cm and using the, uh, the ridger plow to open in the furrows. The, the second test using the disc plow to depths of 20 cm and then using ridger plow to open in the furrows. The third text test using the Haru desk to depths of 25 cm and then using the deer plow to open the furrows. The, the fourth test we open the furrows using the red deer plow to depths of 30 cm only. The last test we open the furrows using the animal drum plow to depths 15 the result the result of this study is obtained or op are obtained from this table uh, the result show it that the highest draft force and the highest field efficiency were recorded by the chisel plow treatments while recorded uh, the highest fuel consumption what she is means high cost of tillage operation. Uh, Redder Blau recorded the less draft and high field efficiency and less fuel consumption when comparing with the other plows. The result also showed that the animal crown plow recorded the minimum field efficiency without fuel consumption. The result observed that the ridger plow treatments is the best for preparing the land, increasing soil moisture content with the minimum fuel consumption, which it leads to an increase the crop. Thanks for attention.